like I say to you every time, it's really, really important you keep an eye on the Islamic calendar as well as the English calendar. The calendar in this country is not the Islamic calendar, it is the pagan calendar. Because we live in this country, obviously we have to follow the pagan calendar, but all the time we should also be looking at the Islamic calendar, we should be looking at what um, date it is, what month it is. So who can tell me, is there anything special about today? Who has been looking at the Islamic calendars? Yes. Yes, what about you? Right, okay. It is Rabi al Awal. That most scholars say is the month in which Prophet Muhammad was born. And today is the 12th. Quite a few hadiths say he was born on that day. Okay? Now, it is really important that we understand the concept of birthdays before we even think of celebrating his birthday. Okay? Birthdays, believe it or not, is the biggest pagan festival which Muslims are following at the moment. The biggest pagan festival which Muslims are following at the moment without even thinking about it. And it's quite sad really when I think about it because pagans are idol worshippers. They worship lots and lots of gods. And Islam came to get rid of paganism. So it is really important we stick to the Sunnah and do what our Prophet did. Okay? So the, this PowerPoint is actually in four separate parts. We're going to start off with a very brief history of birthdays, where all this birthday business came from. Okay? Then we're going to talk about, in Islam, what we do instead of birthdays. Then we're going to talk about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his birth date. What did he do when it was his birth date? Okay, and what should we be doing as Muslims? Okay, so first of all, birthdays originated from before Christianity even got to England. Christianity came to England, who knows when? Only put your hand up if you know. Which year did Christianity come to England? Jesus was not born in England. Jesus was born in Palestine. So this country was not Christian right from the beginning. This country was actually pagan, worshipping lots and lots of idols, lots and lots of gods, like Arabia was, full of pagans. Christianity came here in 400 AD. Did you know that? Through the Romans. The Romans brought Christianity in this country. Before that, this country was pagan. So if we look at the concept of birthdays, some very old fairy tales like Sleeping Beauty, which was actually made in pagan times, has got this concept that when a child is born, evil spirits come to visit it. This is what pagans believe, that when a child is born, evil spirits came to visit it. Now, as Muslims, we also believe that when a baby is born, it cries. Why does it cry? Who knows this answer? Some of the young ones might not know. Why does a baby cry when it is born? Yes. Yes, you. Yes. Yes. Shaitan pinches it. So a baby cries because Shaitan pinches it. We talked about this when we talked about Christmas, that Jesus was the only prophet who didn't cry because the Shaitan did not go near it. So Isa Islam is the only prophet that did not cry. So we also believe that when you're born, shaitan does pinch it as soon as it is born, okay? But the rest we do not believe. What pagans believed, and pagan, pagans are idol worshippers, they believe that every year the shaitan visits it, every year. So if you look at Sleeping Beauty, when the baby was born, a witch did visit it, a bad evil spirit, and they did put an um, evil spell on the baby. If we look at other fairy tales, like the princess and the frog, again, there was a, there was a prince where the evil witch had put a spell on the frog, and it actually the prince, and the prince had become a frog. Okay? So, what pagans believed, and this is pagans only, not Muslims, 
What they believed is that every year evil spirits visit them on their birthday and they should make lots and lots of noise to get rid of the evil spirits. This is where parties come from. Parties come from the fact that lots and lots of people make a noise and the evil spirits will run away and they will not touch the child because there will be too many people. Okay, so this is where the concept of having parties really came from. The fact that um, lots of lots of noise was made to get rid of the evil spirits. What other noises can you think of at a party that people do nowadays where we are copying pagans or stuff? Like we are actually copying pagans and doing these things. Yes. Right. Okay, anything else? Yes. What noise makers? What kinds of noise makers? What do you mean? Music and dancing, astaghfirullah, that originally started from trying to get rid of the evil spirits. Anything else? No? Fireworks was one of them. Yeah, all those noises. So let's put some of them on. Okay, whistles, champagne, bottles. Okay, so that's why people have parties and presents was really a concept of giving presents to wish babies good luck so that the evil spirits won't come near them. That's where presents came from. People would give presents to the babies so that the um, evil spirits won't touch them. This is a really big shirk really because what we believe is that Allah uh, is the only one who can protect our baby from shaitan. Birthday cards, again, they all were introduced all to do with um, sorry we can't come to protect your baby from evil spirits that's how people started giving out cards now originally birthday started from celebrating the birthdays of gods there was the god of the sun the god of the moon the god of thunder the god of war all these things we talked about at christmas Originally, the, the birthdays of gods were celebrated and then later on that tradition went to rich people's families where the families could afford doing birthday parties. So then after that, where do you think that tradition then went after rich families? Yes. No, it just went to everybody else. Okay, this is before Christian times. We're not even into Christianity yet. More common. So it started off with gods. Then it started off with rich people. Then it went into the normal public. And this god is the one that was worshipped the most on birthdays. And this is the god of the moon called Luna. And it's Luna. For Luna, a round cake was made. The cake was round because it looked like the moon and it also looked like some of other th round things that the pagans were worshipping. Any other round things you can think of in nature which the pagans were worshipping? Yes? Sun. The sun, good. I like that answer because that was one of the biggest gods which the Arabians were worshipping. If you think of Saudi Arabia, where Islam came, they were worshipping the sun. And Prophet Muhammad he even made our Salah times different from these sun worshippers. He told us not to worship in the middle of the day, and he told us not to worship while the sun was rising, and not to worship while the sun was setting. For a reason, he told us to be different from the Mushrikeens. He said, you are Mu'minins, which are believers. You are different from the Mushrikeens, which means you are doing shirk and do not worship the sun. We are going to make ourselves different. So when we copy pagans, we're going opposite to the sunnah of the prophet. What else round were the pagans worshipping? They were worshipping the moon and the sun. I've got two more things round, which is why they made a round cake. Yes. No. What natural things? 
Pardon? Earth. Earth, yes. And stars. Earth is a very good one. They were actually worshipping the earth, the trees and the mountains and everything on the earth. And the other one is stars. This was actually happening in, even when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and then an ayah from the Quran said that stop worshipping stars and doing all your horoscopes and things. Okay, so then they would light up the cake to make it look like the moon. This is where candles originally came from. They lit up the cake so it looks like the moon. So they would dedicate that, that cake to the moon. If you think of Hindus, even now they bake, uh, they make food and they give it to the gods, don't they? They put it in front of the god every day. And this is what they were doing. They would make cake, they would light it with candles to make it look like a moon, and they would then give it to the um, goddess. And then, what, what, what do you do normally to candles? Fire. Blow them out. What they do is they make a wish, astaghfirullah. What they believe is that the gods up in the sky, the star gods, will um, listen to their prayers and the dua that they make, the gods up there, they will answer their prayers. So this is this business of blowing out the candle. If all of the candles are blown out, it's good luck. And if some of the candles are blown out, it's not good luck. Okay, is this bad or good? We don't believe in all this luck business. It's all shirk, isn't it? And we believe only Allah can answer our prayers. Also, this smoke, they believe, would then go up to the gods. The smoke would go up to the gods and then the smoke will reach the gods and they'll answer your prayers. Are you understanding everything so far? Yeah. Okay, right. And then, inside the cake, they would hide certain charms. Even nowadays, you can buy Christmas cakes and they have certain things inside. Who has come across this before? They put things in the cake for good luck. Who can tell me some things they put inside the cake? Coins. Yep. Coins, anything else? If you find a coin in the cake, it means you'll be rich that year. Anything else? Yeah. Ring. Yes, if you find a ring, it means you will get married that year. Let's put our ring up. There's the ring. If you find that ring, you'll get married. If you find that sweet, you'll be lucky that year. If you find the coin, you will get rich. And there's one more. A thimble, okay? If you get the thimble, you will, all your life you won't get married. So these are all silly good luck things. We do not believe in any of this. We believe our destiny, our kismet is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Good and bad is all from Him. That's what we believe. And then we've got the birthday song. Right, the birthday song was sung to wish good luck to the baby so the evil spirits won't touch it. Wishing him a happy day. I hope you have a happy day and the evil spirits don't touch you. Then later on, all these things spread around the whole world. Who knows which queen was in this country when all those traditions spread to all our countries, our Muslim countries, the calendar as well. It was not Queen Elizabeth, no. Queen Victoria. Did you know during Queen Victoria's reign, Three quarters of the world was ruled by the British Empire. India, America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, some of the Middle East. That is when all these pagan traditions went into our Islamic countries again. 
Originally, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had stopped all of these pagan practices. But when the British Empire started ruling all the world, everything spread back in our countries. So now what's happening is people without thinking and using their own brain are following all these customs. Now I've got a video to show you. The origins and history of birthdays were biblical references. Birthdays have an ancient origin stemming from magic and paganism, similar to the origins of Christmas and Halloween. This belief in spirits is the reason for many, if not all, of the traditional birthday customs that are practiced today. It was feared that evil spirits were particularly attracted to people on their birthdays. To protect them from harm, friends and family would come to be with the birthday person and bring good thoughts and wishes. Giving gifts brought even more good cheer to ward off evil spirits. This is how birthday parties began. Some scholars believe that the cake in the ancient world has association with the annual cycles. Round shapes of cakes were preferred as these represented the singular nature of life, most specifically the sun and the moon. In ancient times, people prayed over the flames of an open fire. They believed that the smoke carried their thoughts up to the gods. Scholars also say that the custom of placing candles originated because people believed that the gods lived in the skies. They thought that lit candles helped to send signals and prayers to their god so that they could be answered more effectively. The other belief that people held was when a person makes a wish while blowing out a candle, a signal or a message was received by their god and the prayers would be answered. The tradition of placing candles on a birthday cake is attributed to early Greeks who placed lit candles on cakes to make them glow like the moon. Greeks used them to take the cake to the temple of Artemis, the goddess of moon. In present times too, people place candles on birthday cakes and a silent wish is made before blowing out the candle. It is believed that blowing out all candles in one breath means that the wish will come true and the person will enjoy good luck in the coming year. It is a day in which celebration centers completely around the birthday person. As the recipient of gifts, parties, and well-wishing, it is difficult to believe that this seemingly innocent celebration has its origin in ancient mystic beliefs. Supermodel Naomi Campbell celebrated her 36th birthday by living it up in the world's first and only seven-star hotel and rented out all 18 floors for three days. Her total cost $1.8 million. Saying happy birthday to friends and loved ones was society's superstitious way of protecting them from evil spirits. Birthday thumps, bumps, pinches, etc. Party snappers, horns, and other noise makers were also intended to scare off bad luck spirits. Blowing out all candles in one breath means the wish will come true and the person will enjoy good luck in the coming year. Some also smear out the name of the person before slicing the cake to bring good luck. If the cake fell while baking, it was considered to be a bad omen and signified bad luck for the person in the coming year. Other birthday traditions, such as surrounding the birthday person, singing the happy birthday song, even playing such games as pin the tail on the donkey, were all associated with warding off evil spirits and guessing the future and magic. Birthday celebrations are common to the Western culture. However, the origins of this yearly celebration was always linked to mysticism and astrology. The practice of celebrating one's birth in ancient times did not exist. The introduction of the Egyptian calendar became linked to astrology and fortune telling. The keeping of birthdays then was important in ancient times, essentially due to the fact that the date of one's birth was directly related to casting of a person's horoscope. In early civilization, it was believed that horoscopes of ruling monarchs, their successors, and rivals had to be cast with care and birthday omens meticulously examined because the prognostifications of kings and those of royalty affected the entire society. Pharaohs of ancient Egypt gave feasts for their birthdays. In ancient Rome, the emperor gave huge parties in honor of their own birthday which included parades, circuses, and gladiatorial combat. The celebration of days was so important to the average Roman citizen that the Roman calendar designated a majority of days for some form of celebration, including many birthdays of gods and famous men. 
The custom of celebrating one's birth was considered a pagan practice during the 1st and 2nd century AD. Because astrology was closely linked with the date of one's birth, many early church fathers rejected the notion of honoring birthdays because astrology was condemned in the Bible. After the 4th century, celebrating one's birth became a common practice due largely in part to the Romans who having practiced this custom for thousands of years began to embrace Christianity. The calendar we use today is not the same calendar that the Hebrews used. Our birthday according to the Georgian calendar is in fact our astrology date because it does not fall on the same date as the Hebrew calendar every year. This is proven by the simple fact that every year the Hebrew feast days do not fall on the same day according to the Georgian calendar. When we acknowledge our birthday according to the Georgian calendar, we are letting people know our astrology date and not our actual birthday. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9 When thou art come into the land which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through fire, or that use a divination, or an observer of times or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto Yahuwah. And because of these abominations, Yahuwah thy Elohim doth drive them out from before thee. Isaiah 47 verse 13 Ye are wearied in the multitude of your counselors. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the multi-prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. The word birthday is mentioned two times in the Bible. On both occasions, it was a Gentile celebration in which a negative event occurred. Genesis 40 verse 20 Now it came to pass, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Also, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Thus saith Yahuwah, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the custom of the people are vain. Flavius Josephus, a first century Hebrew historian, says this regarding birthdays. Nay, indeed the law does not permit us to make festivals at the birth of our children. Origen of Alexandria, an early theologian of the Christian church, wrote in 245 AD, None of the saints who can be found who ever held a feast of banquet upon his birthday or rejoiced on the day when his son or daughter was born. Origen also asserted that it was sinners alone and not saints who celebrated their birthdays. According to Mitlock and Strong's Cyclopedia, Jews and early Christians regarded birthday celebrations as part of idolatrous worship. We do not honor the Heavenly Father by celebrating birthdays, especially that of his son Yahushua. It is no surprise that his birthday and many others such as Abraham, Moses, Samuel, and John the Baptist were not even mentioned in the Bible. It was never a custom to celebrate the birth of anyone amongst the Hebrews. It's concluded in this video that the celebration of birthdays was indeed a learned custom of the pagans, which Yahuwah forbade us to follow. Did you know that our birthdays, our birth dates, are different every year according to the Islamic calendar? Remember, the Islamic calendar is 10 days shorter than the solar calendar. So every year, you can't celebrate our birthdays, can you? Because every year they're different. But this solar calendar, this lady just explained, and she was a Christian, she's even looked into her own religion, she's explained that the solar calendar was made to link in with astrology, which is haram in Islam. It's written in the Quran, there's an ayah, not to delve into astrology. We are not allowed to believe that um, the stars determine our destiny. Who determines our destiny? Our, our um, gather or future? Only Allah does, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we are now going to talk about the religion of Islam 
and we're going to look at what things we can do to get rid of evil spirits. So, what do we do if we need to get rid of evil spirits? First of all, in terms of birthdays, wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it, right is right if no one is doing it. That is something for us to remember because only we are judged by our deeds. So if you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment and you say, well, my friend Bobby was a Muslim and he used to have birthdays, what's Allah going to say? I don't care about him, I care only about what you do. So you are only judged by your deeds. Okay, that's the first thing. And also, Muslims have to choose the Sunnah of the Prophet. If we are to go to Jannah, we should be following the Sunnah of the Prophet. Anything which is not the Sunnah of the Prophet is regarded as Bidah. Who has heard of that word before? Yes, Bidah means anything which is against the Prophet Sunnah. So we as Muslims, if we do everything that Prophet Muhammad did, then inshallah we will go to Jannah. Okay? Because he was the best Muslim, he was the best person on this world. He was the most perfect person to follow. So happiness, true happiness you can only get from following the Quran and Sunnah as much as you can. Now which sin is it in Islam which will never get forgiven? Who knows? Which sin under no circumstance will Allah forgive? Who knows that sin? Shirk. What is shirk? Who can tell me what shirk is? Muntaha? Worshipping more than one God. Believing in more than one God. Okay? So what I just told you was all about worshipping other gods. Are we worshipping Allah when we copy what these mushrikeens are doing? No. So the biggest sin in Islam is shirk. And we actually, did you know, have a dua as well for protection against shirk. That is the dua of protection against shirk. What else can we do to protect ourselves from evil? Any ideas? We have done this before. Yes. Right, there are specific surahs, but who knows what they are? The first thing is we have to believe in Allah. Anything to do with Allah will help protect us. So any dua or anything will help us protect us. Anything to do with Allah. What's the next thing which we have been told will protect us from evil? Do you know? Does anybody here know? Yes. The Aytul Kursi is very, very good answer. Any more? Yes. What protects us from evil and magic? Yeah, that as well, but something else. Yes, do you know? No, we've already had that one. Aytul Kursi we've had. This is the Aytul Kursi. Any idea why the Aytul Kursi protects you from evil? What's the reason why that is? Who knows the translation of the Aytul Kursi? Do you know the translation? It puts Allah so high, it talks about all his attributes to such an extent that the shaitan doesn't like to hear it and he will run a mile away if he hears you reciting the Ayat al-Kursi. He doesn't like you to praise Allah, does he? And the Ayat al-Kursi is the ayah which praises him so much. It talks about the heavens and the earth belong to him. It talks about that he never tires. It talks about he is the most high, the most supreme. He knows everything before and after. His throne extends over the heavens and the earth. How much more can we elevate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the ayah which praises him the most is the ayat al-kursi. And that's why shaitan doesn't like it. He hates it. He hates it when you recite that, so he runs away. 
So Aitor Kursi is very good for protection. And the, I, the surahs I was talking about is Surah Bakara, first of all. Surah Bakara is really, really important. Who knows the other surahs that go with Surah Bakara that we should be reading to protect ourselves from evil? Yep, what do you call those? The three, the three calls. Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falak and An-Nas are the three surahs which we should be reciting with Surah Bakra and Ayatul Kursi to get rid of any evil spirits. That is what we should be doing, okay? Not birthday parties to get rid of evil spirits. Did you also know that in Islam, a birthday is not a happy occasion because we are actually one more year closer to death. We are getting older and older. We are getting more and more near to the Day of Judgment. Is there anything to be happy about? Ask some of us old ones. Every year we are crying we're another year older. Okay? And the other one is, O oh, son of Adam, this is a hadith, you are nothing but a number of days. Whenever each day passes, then a part of you has gone. It's actually written in the hadith. So is there anything to rejoice about? Nothing to rejoice about, is it really? Okay, so now, the third part of my talk is actually on Milad al Nabi, which means the celebration of the Prophet's birth. Now, looking at everything I've spoken to you about, what do you think? Should we be celebrating his birthday? Allah closes the hearts of people who, who don't want to know. He won't make them understand. And you can tell people to you're blue in the face and they still don't understand. They'll still carry on doing the same things. They'll still carry on saying happy birthday. Even though I've said many times you're not allowed to say that. You are copying, you're imitating the kuffars, the kafir people, the mushrikeens. You are copying them. Why is it we don't copy Hindus? We should copy Hindus as well. They're pagans, aren't they? Why is it we make ourselves distinct from Hindus, but we don't make ourselves distinct from pagans when they are the same thing? Has anybody ever thought about that? We wouldn't dare celebrate Diwali, would we? Right, so put your hand up. Should we be celebrating his birth? No, definitely no is the answer. Fact is, the Prophet ﷺ never celebrated his birth. Why didn't he celebrate his birth? Why do you think? Pardon? Why didn't he celebrate his birth? What was the reason? Because it was a pagan practice, okay? Prophet Muhammad ﷺ entered Medina and there was a big celebration happening there. And when he saw the celebration, he asked everybody, what, what is all of this? And somebody said, the pagans are celebrating a celebration. Do you know what he said? We are not them, and we must stick to our own religion, and we need to celebrate our own two Eids. We will be talking about, in the fourth part, what things we can celebrate. Did you know also that the companions never celebrated his birth? Prophet. Muhammad Sallallahu said, whoever introduces anything into this matter of ours, this is not part of it, will have it rejected. These are his words. Also, the origin of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet is an innovation that was not done by any of the righteous ancestors from the first three generations. It came much later. Do not celebrate the birth of the Prophet. The truth is that his actual date of his birth is unknown. I started off my talk to tell you all that his actual date we haven't even got recorded and it changes every year. Does it not change every year? Because the moon calendar is 10 days shorter than the sun calendar. Furthermore, its celebration is an innovation in Islamic worship. And it's just like the fact that Prophet Jesus' date of birth is not also known. It was not instructed by the Prophet nor by his companions. Did you know that Jews also later on 
started worshipping witch prophet and they started celebrating his birthday, who knows. Christians believe that Isa is the son of God and they worship him. And Jews believe who is the son of God? Jesus. Muntaha. Uzair, they believe that Uzair is the son of God and they celebrate his birthday. So we are copying the people who are doing wrong in the first place. If Christianity was the right religion, Islam would not have come. Okay? First of all, Eid Milad was later introduced by a Shia called Fatimid in Egypt. You can look this up if you don't believe me. Historians differed about the date of the birth of the Prophet. Some said it's in Ramadan, some said it's in Shaban, and some said it's in Rabi al -Awal. Nobody used to write birthdays down in those days. Ask your grandparents, do they know their date of birth? No. In our countries, they'll tell you, sorry, we don't know what day we were born. They don't. They don't. Some maybe educated people, when the British Empire came, they started writing down their births. Ask your great-grandmothers or your grandmothers who are back home if they know how old they are. They'll say, sorry, I don't know. They'll probably tell you they're 21 years old. <laughs> because they never wrote down births. It's not a Islamic tradition. How can a Muslim rejoice and have a party when also 12th of Rabi al Awal is the date our Prophet died? Now there are lots of hadiths to say that Prophet Muhammad died on the same day as he was born. So there should be no rejoicing on that day anyway, even if birthdays were halal. Okay? Number four, birthday celebration has pagan roots. Celebrating birthdays is not allowed at all. Not even, if you, you shouldn't even say happy birthday to anybody. And if they do, it's your duty as Muslims to say, please don't say that because I'm Muslim. If you don't correct it, Allah will ask you on the Day of Judgment that, you know, why didn't you say to that person? Because they're committing a sin, aren't they? Just stay quiet. You don't have to say thank you. You're not allowed to say thank you because you're promoting them to say it again and again to you every year. Number five, this celebration is neither from the Sunnah or the Quran. Anything not part of these are not part of Islam. It's bidah basically. Number six, Prophet Muhammad said, stick to my Sunnah and the Sunnah of my rightly guided caliphs. Beware of newly invented matters for every new matter is bidah and every bidah is misleading. Number seven, Allah says in Surah Maida, This day I have perfected for you your religion. When Islam is perfect and complete, then who gives the authority to people to introduce new things in Islam? Okay? The Quran tells you that Islam is perfect. We don't need to introduce any new thing. Number eight. Celebrating Milad is imitation of Really, it's imitation of pagans, but later on Christians and Jews as well. Jews celebrate birthday of Uzair, and Christians celebrate the birthday of Isa Islam. Number nine, Prophet Muhammad said, whoever imitates a people becomes one of them. If you copy a Hindu, you are a Hindu. If you copy a pagan, you are a pagan. Okay? Number ten, Prophet Muhammad said, be different from mushrikeen. Be a mu'mineen, not a mushrikeen. Because shirk is the biggest sin which Islam does not forgive. Prophet Muhammad said, do not exaggerate in praising me. And this is a quick summary Nothing in the Sharia permits celebrating birthdays. None of the Sahaba celebrated the Prophet's birthday. It is a bidah that was introduced in the fourth century by somebody in Egypt. Imitation of the disbelievers like Christmas, for example. It is an exaggeration of the Prophet. It opens the door also to shirk as well. That is a fatwa that has been given by somebody for the whole world.
Now I've got a video to show you. So when we come back to Tawheed and Ibadah, worshipping Allah, by maintaining His unity in that worship, we do so in the way that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad did. We do not invent or introduce new ways of worship. As some people, for example, they want to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad So they say, well, you know, this is something good. They may even bring a verse from the Quran. They will say, Allah said in the Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. They bring this verse out. And you say, well, what does it say? Celebrate the Prophet's birthday there. It's just there, it's there. This is what it means. It's their interpretation. Right? Their interpretation. The point is, that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad didn't understand that verse that way. And that's why they never celebrated his birthday. And he himself didn't understand that verse that way. And he didn't celebrate his birthday. And the early generations didn't celebrate his birthday. It wasn't until some 400 years after the time of Prophet Muhammad that his birthday began to be celebrated in Egypt in the Fatimid Shiite rule. In the Fatimid Shiite dynasty in Egypt, the celebration of the Prophet's birthday began. So we say this is not legitimate. Some people say, well, okay, leave that aside. Just the idea of celebrating his birthday, what are we doing in the celebration? We're only remembering Rasulullah, we're asking Allah to bless him. You know, these are all good things. We remember his sirah, his life, and all this. These are all good things. Do you say this is not good in Islam? Yes, these things are good things. But to combine them on that day, every year you have now created something new in the religion. This is bidah. Similarly, we could ask, if somebody suggested to you, you have to understand bid'ah sometimes it involves something completely new like the idea of the birthday celebration because we don't really have any precedence for it at all in Islam but bid'ah may actually have precedence in the religion itself wherein a person takes something like after prayers raising your hand in dua after every prayer people raise their hands in dua people say what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Prophet Muhammad said that Allah does not like or he is shy that anyone would raise their hands in dua and that they would put their hands down without fulfilling their wish, their desire. Isn't that implied that we should raise our hands in dua? Prophet Muhammad raised his hands in the dua of istisqa. The prayer to seek rain. He raised his hand so high, that's so how he did it, you could, they could see his armpits. Say, so here's the evidence. But the point is, we do not find any narration indicating that the Prophet Muhammad after every prayer raised his hands in dua. People say, this is picky. Why are you going to get so picky? You know? If it said that you raise your hands, Allah is trying not to give you. He said the Prophet said, raised his hands in istisqa. Why can't we just do it after every prayer then? What's the problem here? We say, the sunnah of the Prophet sallam, is not just what he did, but also what he didn't do. You have sunnah fi'liyah, the sunnah of actions which he did, and sunnah tarkiyah, or sunnah of actions which he didn't do, which are religion, dealing with the religion. Of course, there are many things he didn't do which he didn't like, personally. We're not talking about those. We're talking about things connected with the religion. The things he didn't do, it is sunnah not to do. Very important. Because if one opens this door, that as long as he said this, he said that, we can put it all together and come up with something which he didn't do. Then, 
the religion becomes innovated. You can now change the religion at will. Because I can bring something to you. I say to you. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Prayer in Jama'ah is worth 27 times prayer by yourself. Everybody knows this. He also said. Whenever you enter the masjid. You should pray two rak'at. Two units of prayer before sitting down. Everybody knows this. Let us put the two together. We come into the masjid. I now suggest to you. Let us make tahiyatul masjid in jama'ah. If I suggest that. What do people say? He said no 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 no. You can't do that. Why not? Prophet ﷺ said the prayer in jama'ah is worth more than the prayer by yourself. He also said, whenever you come in, you should do this two rakah. Why can't we put them together and do it? Well, the Prophet ﷺ didn't do it. That's why, yes. He didn't do it, so we cannot do it. He made tahajjud in jama'ah. This is also sunnah. And he did it in jama'ah. We can do it because he did it. But to do tahiyat al-masjid in jama'ah, or to do the sunnahs before dhuhr, the sunnahs after dhuhr in jama'ah, we can't do it because Prophet Muhammad ﷺ didn't do it. And that's emphasized by his well-known statement, "Ma taraktu shay'an yuqarribukum ila Allah illa wa amartukum bihi." I didn't leave anything which would bring you closer to Allah without instructing you to do it. That's the bottom line. If it's gonna bring you closer to Allah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us to do it. If he didn't tell us to do it, it will not bring you closer to Allah no matter how good you think this is, how, you know, how much reasoning you give behind it, it will not bring you closer to Allah. It will take you farther away from Allah. This is the basic principle based on the statement of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever introduces anything new in this religion of ours, not approved by Allah and by the Messenger of Allah, it is rejected. This is to protect the religion in its pristine purity. From change, deviation, etc. Like what happened to the other, religi the other messages which were of Islam but became distorted in time like that of Christianity, Judaism, etc. etc. Okay, so now we're going to look at what celebrations are halal for us to do. Okay, think of all the barakah that Allah has given us. So, Ramadan is the first one I'm going to focus on. In Ramadan, you are allowed to call people around your house and have an iftar. Okay, you can do that. You can invite people to your house and you can have a big iftar and you can feed them. That's like a party, isn't it? Yes, so that's a very good quote. If you spend money on your family, Allah gives you more. And feeding other people is a very, very good thing in Islam. You can have a party, have an iftar party. You can have it even every day. Okay? Right. What else? I want you to name me some celebrations us Muslims can, pr can do. Yes. Eid is the next one. Yes. Eid al-Fitr means celebration of breaking. Fitr means breaking. We are breaking our fast. Okay, that is a very big celebration and it is really important that all parents, they make sure that they celebrate Eid properly. Some people are celebrating Christmas more because everybody has a day off, but when it comes to Eid, the dads are not even bothering to take a day off work. It is really important that dads take a day off work and you tell your children, that you have to celebrate Eid and, and, and make it a big party, Eid. Give presents to your children so they don't wait for birthdays for presents. Give them money. And you children give your mum's presents as well. That's the day to do it, not on Mother's Day. Mother's Day is another um, pagan festival, by the way. 
In fact, all the festivals that we are following in this country, which are not Islamic, are all from paganism. So make it a big party. Okay, what else? What other celebrations can we have? Maria? Good, that's a very good one. We're going to come to that in a minute. Let's do the major celebrations first. Hannah. Eid al-Adha. What comes before that? Eid al-Adha. What comes before Eid al-Adha? Yes. What is the major event taking place? Come on, parents. Hajj. Okay, Hajj is a very, very good time to celebrate. Did you know when I came back from Hajj, I must have had at least 100 people who came to visit me. It was just such a brilliant time. Hajj is the fifth pillar of Islam. When you complete your Hajj, you are completing your fifth pillar of Islam. And in the olden days when people didn't have money, it was a really, really big thing. So Hajj, it's very, very important that um, people celebrate when they come back. In our culture, people invite you to dinner and they do a big feast for you when you've got back from Hajj. Then somebody's already said Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha means celebration of sacrifice and that's the day where we have lots of land to eat because that represents the land which Prophet Ibrahim sacrificed instead of his son Ismail So that is another big celebration that we should have in our um, religion. What else can we celebrate? No, there's more than that, believe it or not. Yes. Pardon? Can't hear you. What does that mean? Pardon? When you finish the Quran, we've had that. We're going to do that in a minute. Something else first. Right, let's talk to you. What did you have just very recently in the last two weeks? Somebody, a visitor in your house. A baby. You had a baby. Did your mum and dad do a hakika? Who knows what a hakika is? Where you sacrifice a lamb and you have a big party. Okay? Okay, so a baby. When you have a baby, in Islam it says, do a hakika, celebrate, sacrifice a lamb, okay, for the child and give the meat to the poor and you can have a big party in a hall, okay? What else? The biggest one you haven't done. What about before you have the baby? Oh, we've done that one. When can we celebrate? There is one festival where Allah said you can even have a little bit of music. You can have some duff. Valima. Who said Valima? Good. Okay, wedding is one thing where Prophet Muhammad said you should celebrate it properly. There should be food. A valima is the um, sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and we should, the boys' family have to feed the girls' family. Okay, so that one you missed out, a wedding. And then the next one. On completion of the Quran, which we've already done. That's the time to celebrate. Some of you, I must say, do bring in sweets to give out. And Isa, where's Isa? Put your hand up, Isa. I know you've got two more Jews left. I'm expecting a party, okay? I want, want to come to your party. You're going to invite me, aren't you? Big one, proper one. Bowling or something and a restaurant dinner. That's the time to do it, isn't it? Once you've finished your Quran, something to be happy about. So when you finish your Quran, have a big party. Okay? You can even give presents to your families as well. Okay, there's one more which nobody has mentioned. 
There is one last one before we finish and then do questions. What about you, Aisha? Have you got an answer? Yeah, we'll do questions at the end. Right, one more. Every Friday. What is it? Chuma. Juma is the Eid of Muslims. Every Friday is the Eid of Muslims. And Prophet Muhammad said, wear nice clothes. You're not allowed to fast that day, did you know? You're not allowed to fast on Fridays because that's the day you should be eating, wearing nice clean clothes. You have a bath, you cut your nails, you trim your beards. And that is the Eid of Muslims. Okay? So. Now we're going to do questions. So can somebody put the lights on, please? Right, we listen beautifully there. Let's be really quiet and listen to everybody's questions. Yes. You said not to pray during sunrise and sunset, but what's Fajr and Maghrib? Fajr is before sunrise, it's at dawn. And Maghrib is after sunset. But at the time while the sun is rising, we are forbidden to pray. At the time of while the sun is setting, we are forbidden to pray. And we, at Zawal time, which is the time when the sun is at its highest point, in the middle of the day, we are forbidden to pray. Did you know why? Because the pagans prayed at those times. The sun worshippers were praying at those times. So Prophet Muhammad said, please be different to them. We have to make ourselves different from them. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Right. Any more questions? Yes, Maya. When we pray at night, are we sort of like praying the moon sometimes? In Ramadan? Right. We do a dua when we see the moon, but we are not praying to the moon. We are praying to Allah. That's the difference. Okay, that is a very, very good question. When we see the moon, we say a dua, but that dua, if you look at that dua, is to Allah, okay, to thank him for the moon. But we are not praying to the moon directly. We never have done. If you think of Ibrahim al-Islam, in his time, did you know there was paganism? What were people worshipping in his time? Who knows? Do you remember that story? People were worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars. Even in those days, there was paganism even then. Um, you know, someone told me when you're 13, um, before you become a teenager, like since the sins don't count. But um, like, say if you did something shirk, would it still like count? Or? Yes, I think on the whole, shirk we should stay clear of. Also. You might sin before you're 13, when you're not a teenager. How do you know Allah's going to forgive you? You don't know, do you? Only Allah knows. So obviously we still have to ask Allah for forgiveness, even if we've done something bad and we realize. But we do not know if Allah's going to forgive us. So better to stay away from that bad deed in the first place. Just in case Allah might say, sorry, I don't forgive that. That's true. Okay? Hannah. Yes. Well, they shouldn't be having birthday cake in the first place or Christmas cake. Do you see what I mean? So if, if they don't have birthday cake, there's none of those things are going to be in there in the first place. That is really big shook because you're actually believing these things can bring, bring you good luck. What do we believe brings us good luck? Only Allah. He's the only one. Good and bad is all from Allah. Did you know that that is one of the articles of faith to be Muslim? We believe that Allah brings us good and bad. Yes. Five seven zero was when the Prophet was born, and six one zero A.D. was when Islam started. When he was forty years old. And that's when the Quran came down. 610 AD was when Islam started. Okay? Right, let's have you. Can yes? How many says the shirk count us? Pardon? How many says the shirk count us? 
Shirk is just the biggest sin which somebody can commit. It leads to hell fun. There's no measure for it. All we know is even a tiny bit of shirk, Allah will not forgive it and it leads to hellfire. Okay? There's no measure of it. All we know is it's that much that even a tiny bit of shirk, Allah will not forgive. Everything else in the end, Allah will forgive, but shirk he does not forgive. Okay, any more questions before we round up? Yes. Okay, if you were Christian and you did shirk and then later on you took the... Uh, um, Right, that's a very good question. If you're Christian first and you're committed to shirk, which you do because you believe Jesus is the Son of God, but later on you become a Muslim, did you know that Allah forgives all your sins before in the time when you was not a Muslim? Allah forgives all your sins. Alhamdulillah, it's such a lovely religion. Allah will forgive all your sins before if you come towards Islam. Okay, including Sheikh, including Sheikh. Hamera. No, it isn't because you thank Allah that he's given you a baby and he's asked us to sacrifice the lamb and give the money to the poor. Okay, that's something he's asked us to do and it's not a birthday because you don't do it every year. Something which you do every year apart from Eid is actually bidah. That is counted as an anniversary. Anniversaries are also haram in Islam. Anniversaries and birthdays were all came from paganism, believe it or not. All this thing about annual. And it's all from this calendar, which is based around astrology. In our calendar, every year our anniversary would go 10 days back, wouldn't it? It's not the same day. In Islam, if we're following our calendar, every year the date is different. Pardon? Jews celebrate Uzair's birthday. They believe he he was the son of God. Uzair is the one who um, fell asleep for a hundred years and he woke up and his donkey was all bones. Hazrat Uzair is His story is in the Quran. And uh, what Jews believe is he was the son of God because he became alive again. Yes. Hundred years it was. Yes. 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 Come, come forward. Have you got a question? Yes. Are we allowed to go to the lunch party? It's really important that you understand. If you were invited to a Diwali party, would you go? Right, so why are we so um, vague about this birthday business? Is Diwali not the same thing? That's also celebrating the birth of Rama and Sita, isn't it? Okay, we have to be careful. When you're young and we're living in this country, so to a certain extent you can go, but you have to really understand in your mind what our religion is. I certainly wouldn't say happy birthday. So basically, also we have to try and make Muslim friends. If we've got Muslim friends, Allah has told us to make Muslim friends, so we stay on the right path. The more you mix with non-Muslims, the more of these problems you will get into. To a certain extent, when you're young, it's okay, but, but once you are in secondary school, it's definitely no. Because these parties, there's so much haram in there. Girlfriends, boyfriends and drinking starts. And the way everybody dresses is not good. At secondary school, if you're invited to parties, it should definitely be known. Right, any more questions before we finish off? You know, you said that you can't say happy birthday to someone's birthday. Could you say that congratulations? No, you should refrain from all of that because you're going against the sunnah. There's nothing to congratulate about. It really isn't. We're just so accustomed to all of this because we're living in this country. Okay? Aish. Um, you just why did they, the non-Muslims, celebrate paganism? <laughs> Ask Muslims that. <laughs> I'm still uh, trying to understand. You know, the Muslims that are celebrating Christmas, 
or, or birthdays. They don't understand their own religion. They are not practicing Muslims. They don't have the knowledge. And I check, yes, and I think what <laughs> Shaheen is saying is spot on. They don't want to know. You can tell them to your blue in the face and they just don't understand. They don't want to. <laughs> There's no fun. Fun is all from Shaitan, by the way. <laughs> Our fun is going to be in Jannah once we get there. There's no fun in this thing. Now. You can have fun on Eid. It's not that there's no fun in our Islam. All these parties I spoke to you about, do everything then. Yes, yes, yes. This is just a, a, a test. Okay, um, two more questions and then we're going to stop. Okay, yes. So if you were to above their party, are you allowed to give somebody a Christmas present? I can say also that, sorry, you know, we don't celebrate birthdays. Give it on Eid instead. What do you know? Then that would be better, I think. Yes. Yes. Right. The question was, if somebody is Christian and they become Muslim, how comes they're not allowed to celebrate all the things they did before? Well, they're Muslim now. You're following the Islamic religion, aren't you? You've left all that rubbish behind and you've become a new person and you've become Muslim and you're, and you're only worshipping one God. If you start doing all those things, you're worshipping lots of gods again. Some people say, this is one I've heard so many times, is that when you're doing birthdays, you're not really thinking of worshipping all these gods, you're not doing any of that. But actually, you are imitating the Kafirs. Why don't you then imitate um, Hindus then? We try and make ourselves so different from Hindus, yet we're doing exactly the same thing by following pagans. And the Prophet said we have to make ourselves different from them. That's the main thing. Right, one last question. Good luck to them then. If they want to go to hellfire, that's fine. But what that person can say is, I'm Muslim and I don't do that anymore. End of the story. Allah will judge them for what they do and Allah will judge you for what you do. Um, well, they can accept it, but they can say also that, sorry, you know, we don't celebrate birthdays. Give me a present on Eid instead. Give it on Eid instead. We've got this Eid coming, we've got this Eid coming. Or oh, I'm about to finish my Quran, can you give it then? And what do you know? Like I say to you every time, it's really, really important you keep an eye on the Islamic 